Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad The title given to me today is uh, Renewable Energy Technology Sustainable Path for a Carbon Free Future Now, um, the contents I will give you some introduction and I will give you the preamble of what am I going to say But basically, what I'm going to give you today is what I do for living for the past 25 years Then I will give you the energy technology, uh, renewable energy technology, not all of it, but the one that I'm working in with, yeah? so that uh, that I know well and I've been working for with it for the, for the past 25 years. And then I'll go into I I I want to answer Tansri's question: Is there a permanent solution yeah, to our energy problem? And I, I'll conclude. Okay, as you know, these are the global drivers: energy security. Only eight countries in the world have about 90% of the petroleum reserve. About six countries uh, in the world that has nearly 60 to 70% of the coal reserve. And similarly, about nine or ten countries that has about 99% of the natural gas reserve. So energy security is one of the driver. Number two, the the uh, the, in, uh, the fossil fossil fuel increase yeah? the uh, the price of the, the the era of I remember the era of five uh, dollar per barrel of, uh, uh, of, of 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 crude oil that era is gone yeah? and then of course the environmental problem associated with the use of fossil fuel you can see this in China uh, the guy is practicing Tai Chi in that kind of weather <laughs> now. If you look into, this is the production for the past, let's say, 20, uh, 20 years ago. And then this is the, per, the predicted demand for it. And of course, the red line shows you the uh, project, uh, projected proje projection, uh, production. Eh? And that separation eh, between that demand and that projection is going to be the, you're going to be known as a net importer of energy. In this term, it's the fluid fossil fuel. And for, for Malaysia, I think we are already a net importer. I remember uh, Tan Sri given the, uh, to giving the, I think it was uh, something I, I, uh, about we are already a net importer. And then this gap is going to increase. My proposal that that gap, to, to close the gap, is to use renewable energy. Of course, because I'm in the field. Yeah, I have to. I have to say something about it. I have to work for it. I have to make my mark of Zorro in the field. Um, this is my thesis. The use of renewable, such as solar, biomass, and wind. I'm going to concentrate only on the three. Uh, is an viable alternative for our over dependency on fossil fuel. And therefore, my hypothesis is that. The renewable energy technology that ha we have been developing eh, for the past 25 years will pave the way to a sustainable, uh, carbon-free future. The renewable energy technology, energy resource, solar radiation, and solar radiation is divi divided into uh, you have geothermal, marine and tidal, and nuclear. So these are the energy resources that we have in the world. Solar is divided into three. Direct solar, which is photovoltaic and solar thermal. And then you have the stored solar, namely the renewable biomass and the non-renewable biomass, which is coal and the fossil fuel. And finally, you have the indirect solar, the wind and the hydro. These are all related to solar, either they're renewable or non-renewable. Today, I'm going to, going to concentrate on this, and I'll give you my thoughts on each of them. First is on the photovoltaics. Photovoltaics is the direct conversion of sunlight into electricity. If you look at the solar resources of the Earth, of, of the Earth, you can see that that, that small black dotted uh, line is actually the primary energy uh, that we produce. Yeah? But the, it is a, it is just a, 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 a thousands, a tens of thousands of the potential that you can get from the solar. It's a dot in a very big uh, rectangle. Now, to know solar, yeah, because I've seen people think that solar can solve everything, but we have some 
inherent in problem that is inherent in our weather. For example, our monthly solar average radiation is about between 400 to 5,000 watts hour per meter square. square. I published a paper in 92 about this. It was 4, sorry, 4.2. The, the value is 4.2 kilowatt hour per meter square per year. A researcher before me, uh, a USM researcher, he obtained a value of 4. Recently, I published the same thing. I got a value of 5.2. So it means that there is a problem of global warming. And it's real. But one good thing is that we don't, we remember when we studied geography before, we say that the uh, wind will blow from this month to this month according to the monsoon. That is no occurrence anymore. Wind is blowing every day, day and night. And, and it's not seasonal anymore. So therefore you can type it from the wind. We experience 170 rainy days out of 365 days. Many opponents of solar energy in Malaysia would say that ours is diffuse. But diffuse is actually has its own characteristics. For instance, try to put your solar panel in Dubai. You will find that the, the coverage of the, the, the dust will basically make the system uh, degraded by almost 70%. So therefore, the, the, uh, the, the rain that we have in the afternoon actually is a natural cleansing mechanism for the solar collector. But of course, the, the solar collector, which is the concentrating solar collector, it will not work under the diffuse condition. Yeah. But it will work well in other types of weather, but not in Malaysia. That's why you, you see that in my, most of my research, I didn't go for that. We ne our relative humidity never falls below 60%. And going back to solar, there are three types of solar in the world. Three types of solar panels. Number one is the silicon-based solar cell which I have worked uh, extensive, extensively in. Number two is the tin film, the cadmium tolerite and the CIGS. And finally, the organic solar cell. Now, for those who say that organic solar cell is in the market, they are the biggest liar. It's not yet. It's still in the uh, laboratory stage. However, tin film such as cadmium tolerite and CIGS is around. Copper, indium, gallium, selenite. And Looking into silicon solar cell, although it is, people say it's mature technology, but there are a lot of innovation that you can do to increase the efficiency. The basics of solar, eh? oh sorry. Any which one, why? Video. Video, eh? Okay. Tak ada tu, eh? You pitch it? Okay. The sun gives out photon. The photon is the packet of energy from the sun. When let's say the photon reaches your chair, it would excite the electron, but the electron never moves. But when it touches a semiconductor device such as this, which, which has a PN junction, it will excite the electron. And the electron will move, and there are, there are certain conditions for it to move. And when it moves, it's basically you can use it to charge a battery or run any electrical devices. But that particular movement of electron depends on the characteristics of the cell. This is the cell with the emitter surface. This is an air, a module. And of course, you have an array. So that is uh, semiconductor physics in uh, 30 seconds. Eh? <laughs> This is a typical uh, uh, standalone system. The battery is used to charge. The, the, the solar collector is used to charge the battery. And of course, you have uh, this, you have this, um, the load, and so on. Of course, there are calculations to do it, to, to, to match the load so that it doesn't mismatch. mismatch eh? This is the typical uh, rural electrification program. Uh, uh, my institute, yeah, we went to this particular place to look into how successful this program are. We visited an, uh, a small uh, Orali, Asli, Asli community and of course, yeah, we found out that the only things working is the panel itself but not the battery. The battery has long gone. Yeah? <laughs> if I were them, I don't blame them. The battery is more, much more useful than the solar panel. It's, it's, this is another solar, solar system, eh? solar, uh, we call it solar standalone system, but this is a, this, these are uh, uh, rich man toys. 
um, we have this, this design follows the uh, F1 right? uh, design and so on but I, I was requested to go for competition I said it's enough, it's enough because too much money involved in it the money is better used for other things unless you get free advertisement from, from, from somebody you can also hybrid it with solar and also with wind as you can see from this diagram next you have the uh, uh, the grid connected system and of course the fin tariff and so on is based on this grid connected system and most of you are aware of it uh, you can also use the grid connected system, connected system for even the parking lot for example this is a parking lot in UKM it is grid connected, it is 3 kilowatt using a, B, a BP solar module now look at the conventional process of making the solar cell if you look at the process from wet chemical etching to acly, uh, texturing, emitting and so on, these are all the processes. You can see that most of these processes are involve a lot of toxic product. So the job of, uh, of many of the scientists is actually to find uh, an environmentally friendly process. And there are a lot of water being used for this. I've seen a, a, a factory in China because basically you have to wash the, the, the panel, or the, the cell when you do it. But uh, there's no environmental regulation for them. These are very toxic material. Some of the material which is used for this, for example, are silane, silane nitride, which is the one they use in Bhopal. The explosion in Bhopal was caused, was, caused, was due to that. That's why if you uh, really want to look into um, uh, 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 foreign companies who wants to do their solar panel factory over here, beware with their, the process that they do. Because people are going towards, uh, uh, away from the uh, process which, in, which, I, which involve a lot of no, uh, toxic material. Now, I, I'll go into this. Eh? You, you put back there. Okay, the process that you see is actually a texturing process. whereby you will put the wafer into a, a solution of acid with specific, uh, with specific uh, uh, formula. And these are acids. You have to, when you texture it, yeah, it will produce a surface that looks something like this. The reason for that is because of anti-reflection. Because if the surface is flat, you are able to basically reflect most of the photons. But if the process is not flat, if the, if the surface is like this, you are going to minimize the reflection. When you have this surface, this is done only through wet texturing. Therefore, you can see a lot of acid and alkali being used. So this is one of the pro problems within the making of the solar cell. Next. Then you, you basically will have to put that solar cell into a furnace. The temperature required is about a hundred, sorry, a thousand degrees C. And it is for four to five hours. Imagine the amount of energy that you require to produce the solar cell. Coming from, from me, yeah, we've done this, a lot of energy. Next. And then, you take it out. After, after four hours, you take it out. The junction is formed. Then it becomes a solar cell, but not yet. Next. So this is the solar cell. The solar cell is raw. Eh? It has it's a P-type wafer with N all over it. With N all over it. Yeah? So a few more processes has to be done. Next. This is another terrible process. Is to put the anti-reflective coating, which is silent nitride. And this is the material that actually exploded in uh, Bhopal. That's why when anybody who wants to build a gigawatt solar cell manufacturing plant here, ask, him, ask them what is the process of the anti coating that they do. Next. And then, remember the solar cell? It is N throughout, so you have to do the H isolation, otherwise it will be short circuit. Actually, the process can be done through sandpaper. Yeah? <laughs> you don't have to do this xenon diaphoride etching system. Next is the screen printing process. 
This screen printing process is to do to make the front contact and the back contact. Remember that that is the grid line, and that small line is actually the 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 the, 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 the road, yeah, the, the mini road for the electron to move to go into the bar. Frontal surface is actually silver. The back part is aluminium. So a lot of silver in the solar cell. And then you have to you, you have to diffuse the silver into the wafer. Then only the resistance become low, so that you can. Next is to test it. Here you produce the IV curve. A perfect IV curve will look something like a square, but then you have, of course you have a, a, a curve in between. You can basically dice it, and you can make small cells. It's, 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 it's alive. You can make it into a smaller and small pieces according to the size of the panel that you have. Then you go through the process of tabbing. The process can be done automated, the process can be done manual. And then it is laminated. And then it goes into the laminator. Sorry. And it is hardened. Of course, this, this requires about 30 minutes of your time. And then the packing process is done. So that's how solar cell is made. You can see that. And then you basically test the module. But three of the elements there, three of it, are very, very toxic. Number one, the, the wet chemical. The acids and the, the, the alkali that you use basically for the texturing process. You require to texture it. Number two, the surface preservation or the anti-reflective coating. The blue color that you see in the solar cell is actually the anti-reflective coating, which is very, very toxic. But what we do in UKM is that you look at the, the cost of it is about 1,000. I'm sorry, one dollar per watt. Eh? And these are very non-environmentally pro processed. What we devise in UKM is that we basically get rid of that wet chemical. We go to a dry texturing process so that you, you will be, you, be using less water. And mind you, a lot of water is used in making solar cell. If, you, if your water cost is very high, no point of making a solar cell uh, uh, plant using this old technique. Number two is that, that it doesn't use the anti-reflective coating. What it does is that it goes into the furnace and the silicon has its own oxide. So you use the silicon oxide itself to basically make it into its own anti-reflective coating. Some, some say what is best to interpret the Quran is to let the Quran interpret itself. So in this case, it's that the silicon itself does the work. It is very, very, uh, and, uh, it's not corrosive, it is it's, it's, it's an oxide, and the process is done at about 800 degrees C. So therefore, you basically save a lot of energy. So, so these are the process, and it goes down to 60 cents per watt whereby you, you basically eliminate three of the most dangerous process yeah, in making the solar cell. This is our center. Now, one of the, uh, the, the, the most expensive thing is the, uh, the silica, the, the, the wafer. The wafer is about 300 micron. So here you can have thinner wafer. So the, the research in this area is to go to more thinner wafer into the 50 microns solar cell. Now, if you look at in the conventional solar cell, which I've said before, yeah, it has a PN junction. The problem with many of the researchers is that there are people in the material science. People in the material science, for them to use more exotic material, they can publish a lot. But for mechanical engineers like me, I don't look into the material aspect. I look into the optic aspect. If I can catch more photons, I am able to basically uh, get more efficiency from it. So this is one way. Remember for mechanical engineers, have you seen fins, uh, extended surfaces? Basically those extended surfaces, something similar to this, yeah, basically would able you to get more of the photon to be trapped. And you have something like this, a honeycomb shape, you trap more of the, uh, um, you, you, you will trap more of the uh, photons. In addition to that, you, you can go for thinner wafers. Okay, with that you can see that if you look at the conventional one, <coughs> this is the conventional one, you can see there's an increase in the current. 
basically when you go into the much more complicated 3D uh, but this two process this is through wet te texturing but this is through dry texturing it's dry process so therefore you don't use any water or any acid or whatever it is so here here where the savings comes eh? now and another aspect is that this is a conventional one that has this you you basically can put those front contacts but the front contact itself basically already cover 20 percent of your surface so what do we do we put all the contacts at the back we call it the back contact solar cell this is a back contact solar cell where the pn is at the back so therefore you can see that a collector this size for 90 watts will be a smaller size with the with the same uh, and you can you can basically save materials from it now the one i'm looking now into is more towards a transparent solar cell a transparent bifacial solar cell i can get electricity on both sides so i'm expect and i use the most um, uh, commonly available material in the world which is silica silicon is about 27 percent of the earth crust as opposed to, to other materials like cadmium tellurium and so on they are even even as i said earlier even diamond is easier to find than this material so that is the work that i've done in solar thermal in solar, solar pv now in solar thermal this tasri doesn't require any subsidy So that uh, uh, answers his first question. Eh? So in solar thermal, there are many processes that require a, a, a low temperature process heat. For example, solar drying, solar hot water heating system, even solar cooling system, and solar detoxification, solar desalination, solar de refrigeration, pumping, and also even daylighting. For example, now we have daylight, we, we can actually shut this particular light eh? and actually use the daylight it's called daylighting and then if you look into uh, solar uh, drying we are still basically uh, an agricultural country a lot of product basically need dry you need dry and the drying is done through either using diesel or open drying which is sub we will subject to a lot of problem of insect infestation and so on so product like commodity like cocoa, paddy, coffee and pepper requires drying and then you have tobacco, tea, banana, anchovies and so on. I went to Kelantan and I told the person from the Philip Morris, yeah, I said that if you use my solar dryer, you can put in your cigarette packet, environment friendly tobacco. <laughs> she said that uh, I even didn't, I even, I'm, I'm the, uh, the uh, a public relation officer of, of, of Philip Morris, but I never let my daughter or son smoke. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, that's gone, my business is gone. Eh? <laughs> okay, we install various solar dryers. Solar dryer is very simple. The innovation comes in in terms of the type of solar collector you use, whether it's a double pass, whether it's a single pass, these are actually the game of the mechanical engineers. To use a lot of extended surfaces, enhancement in heat transfer and so on, that, so therefore you basically can collect the heat from the solar uh, collector, from the solar collector. It's just a simple device whereby the absorber will be heated by the incoming solar radiation and you pick up the heat from the absorber through various uh, techniques, through various configuration. Yeah? You use fins, you use uh, internal, uh, uh, you use double pass and so on. I have the opportunity basically to visit, uh, to have a project with Unido in Cambodia. This is the drying process of, of up to uh, uh, fish, yeah? fish. In, in it. I've, I've completed the project last two years and I visit, I, I, like, I like the place so much, especially when you can get fake LV and uh, fake, everything is fake. Yeah? <laughs> okay, but uh, we went to this place and we calculated the amount of uh, energy needed and finally we we made this solar process for them and of course this is the the the, the it's a community project and um, uh, unido has also put this project in their uh, in the yearly uh, book eh? and if you look into the old process fungus eh? fungus while the new process uh, is no fungus in it but I was surprised that the community doesn't like the new process. They say it's too nice, you know. <laughs> so, I, you know. 
This is the, the one, you know, you know, you know, imagine that the one we have and the one with the others, you know, but, but still they, they, they buy the others. <laughs> Another product that Malaysia is going to look into the future is actually this uh, seaweed. This seaweed is, requires dry. The present method, you see, this is how they, they, they cultivate the seaweed. And uh, once, if you put the, uh, West, uh, uh, the West Malaysia seaweed there, they will eat up these species. Yeah? So they are, they are very sensitive to invasive species. So the drying is actually re is dried in situ. And we are required to make a solar dryer on top of the platform. Yeah? And we did. This is the dryer on top of the platform. And uh, this is the dryer, and this is the drying rack, and so on. The, the, uh, what is good about this is that you, the, from the powder, you can basically make into many products. In fact, in your toothpaste, the xanthan also comes from this particular product. I wish they don't make fuel out of it. Yeah. My, my, my opposition to many of the biomass people is that when something is for food, do not use it for other things. Yeah? This is the solar dryer we have that the, for, for food. For example, these are all the, 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 the food. And I'm looking into now, because this is about nearly about $20, kilogram, $20 per kilo of, of, uh, of cost. Yeah? You can see if you go to K4, a banana, dried banana, will, will cost a lot. Yeah? Solar dried banana will cost a lot as opposed to the other type. But um, I'm, I'm actually going into more, much more um, uh, higher value product. For example, spirulina or even medicinal herbs. This is actually palm oil fronts. You know that palm oil fronts is basically uh, is, is, is being made into powder. We dry powder and therefore you will basically uh, export it overseas eh, as animal feedstocks. This is the solar dryer that we do for uh, Felda, uh, 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 Felda, refined, uh, sorry, Felda facilities eh, in, in Kuantan. Now, cooling. I didn't, I didn't do all the cooling in the solar, but I did one. This is actually the vapor compression cycle, the one that you have now. It consists of four. The compressor, the condenser, the, chill, uh, the evaporator, and the expansion valve. You compress it, then it goes to the, the, the R, R134A, will go into the condenser, and will be throttled and into the evaporator. In the process, you have cooling. How do you change it into a, into, an, into a system? The system previously used electricity to run the compressor. You cannot use the PV because the current is too small. You need a high current. So therefore, the only process to change it if you do it by thermal. The compression process is now done not through the compressor, but through a thermal chemical conversion. So therefore, uh, you'll be using a solution of ammonia and water and when you put some heat into it, the ammonia and water at about 80 degrees, they become separated. They just don't like each other. <laughs> yeah? The ammonia will go this way, the water will go down. But along the way, because they love each other, they were once together, right? When they meet, they become very cold. Exothermic process, they call it. So the, the coldness from here is actually, actually been caught in the evaporator. And because it requires only 80 degrees to separate ammonia and water, Therefore, solar, uh, solar is a candidate for it. But if you look at the efficiency, it's about only 0.4. We call it COP. We don't call it efficiency yeah, because the, uh, it's coefficient of performance. It's, it's, uh, it's output divided by the input, but the input here is, is something else. It's not that. And then, people go for double stage. It means you put two compressor, sorry, two generator, which will cost a lot of money. And the surface area of the collector will be humongous. But what we did is that, in order, and of course with this you can get a COP of 0.9, but what we did is that we will basically uh, use a flash tank, which is very cheap, and an injector, which you can buy off the shelf, and basically do the same thing with the... We did an experiment, if you look at it, we, we have this unit, of course, I'm sorry, this is an experimental unit. Yeah? It's not a, a commercial prototype yet, yeah? because it's a test of concept. So you can see the room is basically between 20 degrees C in, in the room that we have next to it. Now, 
There's another type of uh, uh, um, cooling system called the desiccant cooling system. Here you don't use any refrigerant. What you do is that, if for those who are familiar with the psychometric chart, is that uh, when you are here, you can see that inside the building will be number four. Eh? You can see number one is about 35. When you go to number four, it's about 15 degrees. The whole process it gone, will, will go through this desiccant wheel, but you need some heat there. Because you basically what you do is that you condition the air to remove uh, the, uh, the moisture. So you feel comfortable. Yeah? The, the idea of air conditioning is to, be, to feel comfortable with the less amount of en energy required. This is uh, the unit that we designed. Now, another system is the solar hot water heating system. For instance, for instance if, you, if you look into Malaysia, we have nearly about 200 hospitals and hotels. And the amount of energy use is humongous. <coughs> Yeah, this, this particular thing will, will basically use um, uh, um, for hot water heating for hotels and hospitals is a 24 hours a day usage. So this is the hospital university in UK. I was uh, basically asked to design this. I want to put the solar reactor on top of this. Yeah? But the structure is not, not, not conducive for it. So of course, we, being an engineer, like what Tan Sri said, we are engineers, we are engineers, right? So what we do is that, I say, can we do this particular thing? He said, be careful because down is actually the oncology one, the cancer patient. The, all those uh, radiative uh, equipment are there. But I say, you give me, I, I calculate the loading, then I'll, I'll put the structure up there. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you it's safe. Yeah? So what we did is that we did this calculation because remember now we are in, an, in, in a zone of inclusion. inclusion. So we are afraid that we might not get the, 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 the solar radiation. But we did this shadow casting study. We found that even at 4 o'clock, you still have that particular uh, sunlight. This is the, from another view. So therefore, we, we designed this. And Alhamdulillah, this is the as, uh, winner of the ASEAN Energy Award for the 2013 yeah, uh, in uh, Bali. So this part, even I suggested some of them to basically the cancer patient to just mingle down here because it's very cold. Because the heat is already taken by care by the, the solar, solar, solar collector. This system, the payback period that is about only two years. And in some instances, less than two years. Doesn't require any subsidies. Yeah? Just give me the chance to put in all the 200 hospitals. But look at this, the saving required, the, the saving, yeah? the saving for this is, is, this is a saving. It's about nearly, the LPG saving from this is, the, the highest you can go is about 70% saving from the LPG. But we need to run it 24 hours, yeah? but we, we save almost 70% of the LPG. Now, I mentioned earlier to you that this collector, both of them are separated. One is a thermal collector and the other one is a PV collector, but actually you can combine them. In the, in the European uh, Union, they already have a roadmap for such a collector called the PVT. I am glad to announce that many of our work has been cited in this particular roadmap. See, this is a solar uh, what, uh, uh, hot, what, uh, hot air system which produces both electricity and uh, hot air. And here you can see that if you look at your phot photovoltaic panel on top of your roof, easily it can reach a, a temperature about 60 to 70 degrees. You can utilize that basically too uh, for hot water. And in addition to that, you will cool down the PV panel, which eventually will increase the efficiency of the panel. Another um, thing is that low energy house. There are bas basically there are um, three elements in the low energy house: the usage of daylighting, shading devices, and also cross wind ventilation. If you get these three combinations, if the temperature is about 24, you are very, very comfortable. You don't have to have the aircon. Savings from the aircon will be savings, savings in the demand of, of, of energy usage. So we designed this house, and uh, we like to announce that this particular house has the, the highest rate of air exchange, as opposed to many houses that are designed in the other parts of the world. This is how it looks like, and then we build it this house, and we have basically done a lot of experiments to it. We would like, you know, some of the house to be, it looks like this, eh? but it, 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 some of the best features of the are, are there. Now, the next is uh, the biomass. I didn't work a lot in biomass, but in the 90s, I designed a, a full-dust bed combustor. 
And I don't know why people are not catching up in fluid dust bed combustor. Fixed bed combustor, the one you can you, you see a lot of them in the market today, basically the fuel is actually been burned from one side. Then you have to roll it or something to basically to, to, to use the other side of the fuel to, to burn it. But in fluid dust bed combustor, you float it. When you float it, the burning is done in every part of it, throughout the... the, the but of course, there are limitations. You have to basically process the fuel into pellets. But the temperature is less than 1,000. It means that there is no nitrogen formation. Nitrogen oxide formation, sorry. And also, you can capture the sulfur dioxide by putting a little bit of gypsum, uh, 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 calcium carbonate into it. And the product is actually gypsum for, to be used in the uh, uh, building industries. This is the food dust bed combustor that I designed in the, in the, in the early 90s. It never picked up the design, but since then when I did my PhD, I never burned things anymore. This is my last experiment that I burned things. Yeah. So I, I, all the knowledge I have, I keep it, you know, how to design it and so on for the next. So, some people ask me to, to design it and apply for my PhD, and I said, wait, this is, keep it first. Yeah. It can be used later. Eh. Now, with indirect solar, the indirect solar, of course, you have the, the, wind, uh, sorry, the wind and the hydro. You have large hydro, and then you have the, the, the small hydro, the mini hydro, the micro hydro, and the pico hydro. I cannot go into this large hydro, I'm not in that business. But I can go into the pico hydro, because the pico hydro is everybody's business. A small stream will make a big impact. For instance, if you look into a pico hydro scheme of 2 kilowatt, it's enough to supply a house of a hundred house yeah. uh, uh, we, to, to just power the fan and the radio and some lighting and the cost of it is much much cheaper than the standalone PV system that you have in the market now I proposed this particular project uh, in uh, um, Kampung Tui uh, in Kelantan I was uh, uh, we, we managed to get it running but of course if you look at this yeah, this is very nice, yeah? we, we, cre we create this, but eventually this is full of silk because there is illegal logging when up there. Yeah? <laughs> very nice people, eh? very nice people. Yeah? And then, uh, you know, they are looking to the future eh? for, 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 for power yeah? and also wa water. Eh? And if you can see from here, I, there is a, we have a lake yeah? at the UKM. And I saw there is a, there's water coming out from the lake. So I say, why don't you utilize it? It can create almost two kilowatt of power, in small lakes. And the, the head is only about uh, 0.5 meters. It's not like uh, 10 meters or something like that. So I can, basically, in this, you can use this Pico Hydro throughout, even the, when there is available water flow. And wind. Malaysia is basically characterized by low wind speed, low wind speed, eh, as opposed to high wind speed. But because of the low wind speed, you need to design uh, innovative ways of capturing the the the, uh, the, the wind. Eh? This is one of it. This is a vertical wind turbine. Not only the the, the fan moves, but the individual fan, the individual this also flips. This will open, this will be closing, and then it will turn down, and the vice versa, it will happen. So you can, you can basically have a double effect. And this is good for our predominantly low wind uh, situation. I published the first paper on wind uh, in 1992. Then I was accused of telling the world that Malaysia doesn't have any uh, wind potential. But if they read my paper, I didn't say that. I say we have potential in the coastal area and in the some of the uh, resort islands yeah, that we have. Yeah. So this is from another view, and this is a solar, uh, this is a solar wind hydrogen system that we installed in in the UMT campus, the University Malaysia Terengganu campus, and I think this is also provide you one of the best solution for basically for 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 remote islands. We wanted to install this, this, this particular system in the Bidong Island, yeah? but we, has, we still have you know, um, uh, difficulty in finding funds for it. Okay, now the, 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 the second last one. Is there a permanent solution to this? <laughs> for instance, 
if, if I were to use all the things that I have done earlier, would I able to close the gap? This is it. Let's say I use all the solar, solar dryers and all the exotic PV panels and so on, all the environmental friendly solar panels, the low cost. Yeah, I may have that. Yeah. And then I use all the others, yeah, the solar thermal system, etc., and so on. You know, all the hospital in the world is actually done, yeah, have solar panels and also solar thermal system. Still, yeah, I will basically uh, increase the time that we become a net importer of, of oil. Yeah. So, I would like to basically introduce back this concept, the concept of hydrogen. Hydrogen is a very uh, safe fuel. If you see the Zeppelin, eh? the Zeppelin, eh? if you look at the Zeppelin, the reason for, there are only six people died. They died because they jump. <laughs> they jump from, the, but the rest, they are safe. The explosion is actually because of the envelope of the Zeppelin is actually uh, a fabric which has been um, uh, covered with methane. So, so uh, sorry, not with methane, with, uh, with butane, I mean the, the liquid fuel. So when you cover it, so the, the reason for the explosion is that because the hydrogen has long gone. It's gone because hydrogen molecule is very small. It's like before you say, before you clip your eyes, yeah? before you, eh? the, the thing is really gone. So it is not due to the hydrogen. It's due to the other combustible material inherent in the envelope of the Zeppelin. That's what makes hydrogen bad name. Hydrogen basically in a containment is one of the safest material. And of course it's explosive. Yes, wood is explosive. Yeah? Otherwise you just use wood. You use wood for your car. Yeah? We need to use the hydrogen. And if, if you have an LPG uh, 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 vehicle colliding with a hydrogen vehicle, or, or let's say a uh, LPG vehicle yeah? colliding each other, you can see 10 cars yeah? from there everybody will die. Because it goes this way. But hydrogen goes this way. You call you collide, nobody dies. Oh, what happened? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so the transition towards the hydrogen economy. The problem is that the first country in the world who is going to be 100% hydrogen is actually Iceland. But because of the economic crisis they face during the past two years, they have to stop it. Iceland has a lot of geothermal resources, which basically can be converted into hydrogen as energy carrier. The transition towards hydrogen it basically has been, uh, has been done now with the usage of many of the uh, to, um, uh, hybrid vehicles and so on. This is transition towards hydrogen. Now, if you look into the hydrogen economy, <coughs> basically water is being going to be split into hydrogen and oxygen, uses as energy carrier to be used in the um, in, in all those uh, important uh, electric sectors, such as the uh, residential, commercial, and the, the, uh, uh, the industrial sector. Product of combustion is just water. Look at this, yeah? I give you an example of coal. Tan Sri said just now he has to use coal. Go ahead, use the coal. Yeah, Tan Sri? But to a certain time, and then we convert it. For example, if you look at the conversion efficiency, 38% for uh, Tan Sri, for, for, for most, most of the up to up uh, the best of the best up to uh, coal power station. You have to go to coal and you have to transport it and then go to the power station. Now imagine if you use a hydrogen. It's coal and then you use it as as um, as hydrogen plant and then of course you'll be using your fuel cell and so on and the efficiency is about 42 percent. So the long term but the long, -term, uh, the long term performance of this system is going to be very sustainable. It will not produce any carbon dioxide. And besides, yeah, all the petroleum, whatever that you have, you just keep it. You just use other things. Yeah. You, basically, this is an artist's impression, basically, of uh, the whole renewable energy system being used to produce hydrogen. Now, I would like to show to you, eh, if the Bakun project yeah, basically is used to produce hydrogen, we are already a rich country by now. Uh, the cost is not that much to basically, if you look into this, this particular uh, uh, diagram, yeah, you can see that you can always transfer the hydrogen via the uh, under, underwater, yeah, uh, uh, not, uh, 
pipe yeah? because imagine the options yeah? the option is DC, AC and this of course they, they cancel this project yeah? <laughs> Alhamdulillah they cancel it otherwise we'll be, uh, we will be will be in debt for the next 200 years but imagine yeah, if they can do this yeah? the, one, the one I showed you earlier you can basically put that hydrogen into our PG with 40% no change in the characteristics but we, we basically are not alone in this thing. People are suggesting it's elsewhere. For instance, this is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is thinking also basically to, uh, to, to save some of their oil and basically export hydrogen instead. And you can see Canada because they use this uh, hydropower. And the technology is not that, that uh, unusual to us. Eh? Prof. Hamdani and myself, we have a project on uh, fuel cell before. And this is some of the fuel cell that we have uh, developed in our laboratories. So fuel cell is a very, is a, is a chemical device. I think Prof. Hamdani will explain it more on the fuel cell. And uh, this is actually a UK patented fuel cell. And we have a research institute just solely on the fuel cell. And of course, the electrolyzer to split the atom, to split the water using solar. This is a particular setup that we have in UKM to, to, to do that. And uh, this is the, the, basically this is the eco house that basically uh, uh, will, will, will uh, generate electricity connected to the grid and also basically used to uh, split the water via the electrolyzer. So this is actually a zero energy house yeah, in, in its actual thing. Now, some of my conclusion. Yeah. Okay, I introduced you four strategies basically to look into bringing renewable into the mainstream and as well to use renewable for the carbon free future. But I will touch a few. This is a solar farm. I am against this concept. Yeah. Number one, of course, we have to develop our infrastructure. But having solar farm is not a good idea because you will be using a lot of land and the land costs money. It's not, when, when things go unwell, yeah, you will blame me as a solar scientist. But I didn't suggest it. I would suggest to go for building integrated photovoltaics. Because the house will be there for the next 200 years. The farm, if I decide to build something else, then it's a different story. Now, number two, the second aspect is our policy aspect. This graph shows you the wall that we have for the past 20, 20, 30 years. And with the price of oil, with the price of crude oil, with the current price as well with the 2012 price. If you look at all our policy, it's basically done when we have problem with price oil increase. Nothing to do with the environment. It is a reaction against something else. It is biting at the wrong neck. <laughs> So our policy, our next policy should basically take things into totality. And the problem is that all these policies are electricity policy. There should be also, a, 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 I think the green policy will be actually going towards that. The energy not only comes in the form of electricity, but it also comes in the form of cooling and also heating. The next thing is that if you look into the value chain, if you look into the value chain for solar, for instance, it comes from sand, and the sand is from Malaysia, goes to the ingot, making the sand, making the panel, making the system, making devices, the, and of course, the balance of system, the batteries, the inverter, the cables, and the contractors. We have, this we cover. We have a lot of people working in this field, but actually we didn't make a lot of money, because why? We are not here. This is where you make the money. Yeah? So for the next future, we should go into this part of the value chain. And of course, you, you need to develop your own roadmap yeah, for the future. And the roadmap should be um, using the latest technique you can find eh, in, uh, in scenario buildings and so on. Probably you, no, you, you need not to do forecasting, but you need to do backcasting. Yeah, to backcast yeah, from the future back to the current situation. And of course, everything to me has to be market orientated. Yeah? You have to put a dollar value to every product that you want to produce as a target. Okay, I think uh, with that, yeah, I've given to you some of my thoughts yeah, after 25 years of working in the field. 
um, the solar, the renewable energy technology that we have developed for the past 25 years. We have about 30 patents of all of them. And with that, yeah, uh, you can see that to create a sustainable future, carbon-free future, is not a dream. Yeah? It's going to be a reality. As what um, many uh, many of the futuristic people yeah? uh, along that line, yeah? even even BMW, even companies, uh, big multinational companies, they are going for 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 a carbon-free future. Yeah? Even the the oil producers yeah, are thinking along that line. BP changed their name their name to Beyond Petroleum. So, in, in anticipation for a carbon-free future. Thank you.